Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we would just love to welcome everybody here this morning, and uh, particularly the visitors, any new visitors. Um, everybody is really, really welcome, and I hope you can settle down now and just kind of recenter yourselves into what this is all about, and it's all about the Lord. Um, I will be making a few announcements, but first of all, I would just like to start in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being here with us today. Bless us all. Bless all those, Lord, who feel burdened, who are carrying very, very heavy loads of grief, who are in despair, who are suffering disappointment, people who are losing jobs, people who are under financial strain, people who are worried about family and war zones, and so much more, people who are disappointed over relationships, broken relationships, marriage problems, and I can go on. I ask you, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit amongst us now, that your Holy Spirit will really be present here today and will reveal you to us. We ask you, Lord, to give us, through your Holy Spirit, open hearts to encounter you here this morning, to encounter you through the worship, through the prayer, through, this, through the teaching, to every aspect of this service, Lord. It's all about you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are making this morning possible, and for all those that have struggled to get cars, their cars parked. We bring it all before you, Lord. We ask you today to, to bless Billy as he comes to share your word. Would you bless him, Lord? Would you, would you bless him and work through him and bring your word through him to us, Lord? Would you give us a fresh revelation of who you are? Would you give us an enlightenment, Lord, of what you have promised through your son, Jesus Christ? And from, from, the serve, from the wedding celebrations yesterday, we want to, to magnify you, Lord. We want to magnify your name. And in magnifying name, we magnify you. And when I think of magnify, I think of making you bigger. We ask you, Lord, that you be bigger in our lives, that we are bolder about you in our lives that we stretch out a hand when it's difficult, when we give time when we don't want to, when we give of our personal resources, when we give excuses that we just can't do that. We thank you, Lord, for being present here with us today. Amen. Announcements. Guess what? They're married. Right. Yay! <laughs> What a celebration. And were you watching it online? Was anybody? Yes. So um, I was, I, Nikki and I were watching it as well. And honestly, if you haven't watched it, I, I suggest you do. It's, it's, if you go into the, Fish, the, the Fisherwick Presbyterian f Facebook, is that right? Website, whatever you, you go on to. Yes. Anyway, it's there. It's recorded. And it's worth looking at. It's just that it was such a celebration of joy. Yes. Oh, who's married? <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for that. I love that. That's a good thing about this church. You know, you can be pulled up um, publicly, and we don't mind at all. And thank you for that very much. It's Richard, our, our minister, and Mimi were married yesterday. And we're just all so excited for them. I am anyway. Uh, and delighted about this day. Um, it was just such a celebration, like the singing and the clapping and the, the music. Uh, the whole sense of expectation was fantastic. And the joy, I just felt the joy oozed from everybody there. And the community, the coming together of both families and friends, and they really made this. It was so simple as well. It wasn't overdone. There was something really um, deep and spiritual I felt about it. I felt the, ho the Holy Spirit was really there um, in, the, in the presence of those people. Um, and I just think that 
you know, it was a real example. I think the pacing of the possession of the of the bridal party going up the church and setting setting the slowing every really slowing everything down and slowing down the pace and and then the appearance of the bride beautiful Mimi coming up beaming and then Richard trying to look cool but um he did his best but he looked really handsome as well didn't he and the expectation of him and just the joy between them was wonderful I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for this union. And, and we, I ask you, Lord, to bless them as they go forth in their marriage, every aspect of their marriage, that they would just know a unity and a friendship and a real sense of intimacy between them. And I ask you, Lord, that we as a community really do support them. They will need support. And we will have an opportunity just to put in your diaries a barbecue, the 25th of September. It's a day that we can really celebrate Richard and Mimi uh, on their return. Um, and we'll be able to welcome Mimi to join us here in LPC that day as well. So please put it in your diaries. And if you know and other people that are not here, maybe just spread the word. We want to have as many people here as possible. And just on the same note, and Dorothy has kindly been showing you a card in the porch. If you'd like to sign the card for Richard and Mimi, please do. We'd be delighted for people just to express their celebrations and, or their congratulations to them. And just on weddings, I want to uh, congratulate uh, Mick and Trish on the wedding of Stephen and Jen, Trish's son and his, and his uh, now wife and their children. And I ask you, Lord, just to bless them, to bless Stephen and Jen in these days, that you would become a real a central point in their lives, Lord, that you would become an active part in their lives. And we ask you to bless them, direct them, and protect them, that whole family, and Trish and Mick, in these days. Amen. Um, now, what else have I? Just the others, and a short announcement is just about J Club. Um, J Club is a little club we have for four to eight year olds, and we are looking for volunteers, please, to join or to help with J Club. And before, in your own mind, you're saying, Not for me, not for me, no, no, that's good. I wonder what's the next announcement. Just sit with it for a little bit. Just ponder it. You won't be left alone. You won't be left without training. You won't be left without material. But just listen to your hearts. And if you feel, if you feel in your heart a sense, I could do that. I could really show God's love to these little ones. And that's what it's all about. Directing their hearts to you. I can do that. And if you feel you can do it, please give your name to Carol, uh, our administrator. She's at the back of the church or any time during the week if you just leave a message in the office. Finally, I would like to welcome Billy Swan and thank you very much for being here today with us, Billy. Billy is from Dublin Family, Reach, uh, Family Outreach in Ballyfermot and he will give us an update on what's happening there. He's also been an amazing uh, support link to in, Dr in Druidstown House and he does incredible work in Ballyfermot. So I'd like to welcome Billy now to take it from here. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Richard for the, the opportunity to come and share this morning. And I'm sure, uh, along with what Mary was praying there, we all wish Richard and Mimi uh, God's richest blessing in their lives together. I do want to thank you as well for being here. It wasn't easy getting here, was it? It's a, a cold, drab, uh, rainy morning. Now, when I left Drewstown this morning, the sun was shining. Drewstown, where it's always beautiful. I didn't even think to put a jacket on. It was so nice. And I got up here and looked at it. Uh, but with the festival in Isle and uh, problems with parking, I'm so glad uh, that you all are here this morning. But whether you're here or you're there online uh, watching with us, we're here this morning to worship our God. Psalm 100 tells us this, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. That's what we're going to do now as we come together and we sing our first song together, come people of the risen King.
Let's stand together and sing. Of course, through the week, uh, we had the passing of uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and I know we're the Republic, but they are our closest neighbours, uh, and I'm sure you won't object if we do offer our condolences to the people of the UK and their Commonwealth uh, on the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. It must be uh, quite a time over there uh, for that nation, and our, our thoughts are with them at this time. Let's all bow your heads together in prayer. Let's come before the Lord. Father God, we come before you this morning, for you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega. A queen passes in a kingdom and a nation mourns, and we, yet we serve the risen King. We serve the one who shall never pass. We serve the one who rules over all. We serve Almighty God, not just an emperor, not just a king, not just a Lord, but the Lord. And we come before you this morning into your presence with joy and with celebration to worship you, Father. For not only are you the God who created all that is, you're the God of recreation. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in your creation, in the beauty of it, even on a morning like this when it's gray and it's dull and it's cold and it's wet. It reminds us, Father God, of the warmth uh, of bright sunny days as well. A time of year in between summer and winter. We come to you, Father, at a time of change. 
time of change in our country, Father. And we come to you, Father God, a time of change in the world with war and with famine and with fire and with pestilence, Father. We come to you. We come to you, Father. We come in confession that we have not always been the people that we should be, not always done the things that we should have done, but rather we've done things, Father, that we should never have done. We have sinned against heaven, against each other, but against you, Father God. And we come to you now in confession, asking, Father God, that in your mercy and by your grace, you would forgive us our sins. For you are a forgiving God. You are the God who is love. You're the God not just of the second chance, or the third or fourth, or the seventieth chance. We come to you, Father. We come to he who will forgive us. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. And you will forgive us our sins. Father, we bring them to you now and ask for your forgiveness. That we will be washed, washed by the blood of the Lamb, washed by the one who gave himself for us. Father God, we come to you now asking for your blessing on this time together. Asking, Father, that you go before us. Speak to us, Father, something not necessarily new, but something true, something meaningful that we can take through this week, Father, that our lives may be turned more to be like Jesus than they were before. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to stand together again, and we're going to sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. This is the very first hymn I ever learnt off by heart many, many years ago. And uh, I'm not sure if Richard chose it simply because an old person was going to be here uh, preaching, because it does seem like an old person sort of a hymn, doesn't it? Um, uh, young people um, would call this, uh, this is an old people's church. I don't know if you ever heard that before. Um, but uh, no, it's an old people's church. Oh, no, no, they will sing old. Well, let's sing it with gospel this morning and prove them wrong. Let's stand together and sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Oh, please be seated. Yeah, you, you don't need me to tell you. Just sit down at this. Now, uh, boys and girls, we have a couple. Uh, is there any boy or girl this morning who would like to come up the front? And it, uh, it, oh, I was told to say, any young person, anyone young at heart would like to come up and, and get a sweet. I'd, I'd, I'd like to give a sweet. Today, boys and girls, you see, we're going to be talking about little things. There you go. Have any one you want. Okay, have a couple. There's, 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 anybody you want? I'll, I'll come to you instead. It's okay. There you go. I'm not even lurking. Nobody's lurking. It's okay. Grab one. Click. There you go. Very good. You see, we're t- today, boys and girls, or boy and boy, whichever, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be thinking about little things. Little things. Oh, I'm, oh, of course you can. There you go. Not that one. No, that, yeah, that was a nice one. Yeah, well, and maybe, well, afterwards, I'll give you another one. Because we're thinking about little things. You see, they're only little sweets, aren't they? And we're thinking about little things. And little things, well, did you ever tell a little lie? Anybody ever here ever tell a little lie? Oh, Brian did. Oh, Brian, Brian, yeah, Brian, hand up straight away. Little things, it's only a little lie. If I was to tell you, I'm going to give you a sweet, and then I didn't give you the sweet, that would be a lie, wouldn't it? I told you a lie. I said I would give you a sweet, and then I didn't give you a sweet. That's a little thing. And it's only a little thing. It's only a little lie, isn't it? I mean, that's nothing big or important. It's just a sweet, and it's just a little lie. But you know what? All the little lies can get us into big trouble with other people. Little lies, you see. If I was to keep telling you all the time, I'll give you a sweet, and never give you a sweet. Well, the next time I come back, after telling you that several times... You're not going to believe a word I say, are you? You stop trusting a person who tells you lies. And if you had a best friend who was always telling you lies, they wouldn't be your best friend for very long, would they? Because you can't depend on a person who's always telling you lies, even though it's only a little thing. I also brought with me not just sweets, and there's one for everyone in the audience, but is that a little lie? I also brought a lamp with me. Now, I hope this is going to work because whenever I brought the lamp, I didn't bring an extension cord and I had to get one from the J room, so I hope it still works. But there's something, boys and girls, there's something wrong with this lamp. You see, when I switch it on, it's not working. It should be working. It's it's not working. It's not lighting up. It's broken. And I checked the plug because all mammies and daddies know well, if it's not working, check the plug. might be the fuse, but the fuse is good in there. And somebody, somebody else, well, you might want to check, check the bulb. Isn't that good? Check the bulb. Now, it's only a little thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I'm, I'm going to unplug it because before you take out the, the bulb, health and safety, you should always pull out the plug. So, we'll set that there. And I'm going to take out the bubble. It's a screw-in one. Now, it's, that's only a little thing. And you take that out and you look at it. Now, it used to be the bulbs were clear and you could see the filament inside. Give it a little shake. It doesn't sound like there's anything wrong with it. But, oh, hold on a minute. Now, you see, if you were still up here, you'd be able to see. So, I'll come over here to my good friend, Nick. Nick, have a look. There's a little thing wrong with that bulb. What is wrong with that bulb? There's a little bit of sellotape right on the end of the bulb. I wonder why that's there. We'll take it off. I can get that off. I mean, it's just a little bit. It's just a little thing. And when you take it off, it's, it's so little you can't even, well, can you see it? It's so little. It's only a little thing. But it was stuck in there for some reason. Maybe it was part of the packaging or something. We're going to put that back in again. And we're going to plug it in. Now, I'm not sure if it's switched on or switched off now, so... (gasps) Now it works! Isn't that amazing? It was only a little thing, but it got between the bulb and the lamp. All lies that we tell get between us and other people. And they turn out to be big things and they stop us working the way we should. And worst of all, our lives get between us and God. Because God gave us a command. God knew 
that the little things like lies would get between us people. And so he commanded us, do not lie to each other. Do not tell lies. He gave us that command because he knew it would lead to trouble between people. That's why we shouldn't lie, not even little things. We should always be honest with the people around us. Now, maybe that gives the adults something to think about as well. But just for now, we're going to sing together a wonderful little song inspired by the talk. This that light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. offering will now be received. Let's unite hearts together again in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you this morning for the many and bounteous gifts that you bestow upon us from which we bring now just a very little. For what we offer to you, Father, is nothing compared to what you have given to us. We thank you most of all, Father God, for the gift of your Son, for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who comes to us and is tender with us and who makes our burden light. Father God, as we face the challenges of life today, and we struggle, and we look for help in every quarter, Father God, may we be reminded that our help comes from the Lord. Teach us, Lord, to look to you always, and in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Now Claire's going to come and read her scripture to us. Or maybe she's going to stay where she is and read the script. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. If you want to follow along, if you have a pew Bible, it's on page 1219. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? 
But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. This is God's word to us. I'm going to lead you in our prayers for others. Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Let us pray. Father, I ask you to put an honest prayer in my mouth. And I pray that we would know your presence as we turn towards you for the needs of the world, the needs of our nation, our local needs, and the needs of this church family. Father, we we are weary of the war in Ukraine and we are not affected physically. So how weary must those be who are suffering through the perils and pain of war? And we boldly ask you, Father, to bring that war to an end. We ask for peace and for justice and for all those who are now dispossessed without homes, for widows and orphans, we pray your mercy, Father. And we call in your mercy, Lord, too, for everywhere where there is hunger, and that includes Ukraine, and that includes the United Kingdom, and that includes some houses in this country. But we pray against hunger in a world that is so rich, and we ask, Father, for your solutions, and for your Holy Spirit to show us where to direct our resources and how. Nationally, Father, we pray for those who are homeless or facing homelessness, looking into the winter. We think of refugees who had temporary accommodation that is now gone. And we think of all who are in institutions or family hubs, where entire families are living together in one room, those who are in direct provision. It's a great shame on our nation that we do not house our neediest and most vulnerable. And we ask you to raise up leaders who will respond to this. Father, we, we pray for politicians who are motivated by the good and not by the cushy number. And we know that everyone working in these areas is overwhelmed. And we pray for your support for everybody who is responding. Locally, Lord, we we know that there are families who are suffering in Lucan and the surrounds. And we pray that you would be close to them and show us ways to be close to them to show people your face in mercy and friendliness and fun and warmth and kindness. And we ask that this festival would be a great success, that people would um, meet one another and it would be another inching towards recovering from all the social harm of the pandemic. And we pray for the other churches, our brothers and sisters in the faith here in Lucan, that they would flourish and grow and that we would grow in our relationship with them. 
and that we would be able to love within our differences. And here in LPC, we hold to you, Lord, all who are sick, all who are living in uncertainty, waiting for test results or other news, all who are grieving, all who are struggling financially. And we ask you to draw them close. We pray for your focus, Father, and your perspective, that we would see things with holy eyes and not through the concerns of the world. And I echo Mary's prayers this morning for Richard and Mimi. Um, what a joyful thing. Uh, how wonderful to have Mimi join our family here. Uh, we pray that you would richly bless them in all the ways uh, that their hearts desire. And I pray that uh, we would be able to care for them and look after them as they make huge changes. And we think particularly of Mimi, and we ask that when she returns from honeymoon to a completely new life, that she would feel that she has come home. And we thank you for Richard and his consistent leadership and care for us. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who loves us and who died for us. Amen. We're going to sing again. We're going to lift our voices in praise and adoration to your God in the words of the hymn, Ancient Words. Now those words that Claire read to us from 1 Peter, we're going to be thinking about them today and thinking in particular of three things, doing good, doing evil, doing Christ. But just before we get there, just a quick couple of minutes update on 
Dublin Family Outreach. Uh, we're thanking God. Um, we had a full summer of camps, nine weeks of camps uh, down at Drewstown House. Two of those uh, just were family camps for Dublin Family Outreach. And it was fabulous to be able to get back to doing camps uh, fully with uh, international volunteer teams that came in and helped us there. It was pretty tough over the past couple of years because volunteers couldn't come and help with the camps. So it was really good to get fully back into camps again. And even better because at the end of the last camp, uh, we were able to baptise three of the people who are part of Dublin Family Outreach. And that's always a real joy for a church to be able to baptise people who have come to know Christ, who are coming and going on with Christ as well. Now, those three, along with uh, a good number of others, are meeting with us each week and have been for the past year. In fact, last week was our first year anniversary of Family Fellowship Church. We were called Dublin Family Outreach, and so a, a, group, a core group of people came together and said, we want to we meet together like Christians do on Sunday and have a service. And so we thought, well, what will we call it? It's going to be a church, a gathering. What do you call it? So we decided, well, if it's Dublin Family Outreach, then not call it Family Fellowship Church. And so that kind of stuck. So Family Fellowship Church is a year old now, just uh, this week passed, and we praise God. In that time, the number has just about doubled uh, to, to a group not much smaller than what is here this morning. I know usually the church here is, is much larger, uh, but just for the group that's here this morning, we're praising God uh, that he's moving in people's lives there in Ballyfermot and in Drimna, uh, uh, the area next door to Ballyfermot, and we praise God for all that he's doing. Please pray for us this week. We're starting up again, or life studies. Um, there, there'll be uh, a men's one uh, one week, then a woman's one the next week on a Tuesday. So we're alternating between the men and the women. Uh, because we have couples and it was very hard for them doing one on a Tuesday and one on a Thursday and another one on Wednesday because last year we had three on, on those three evenings. Uh, then Wednesday night we, we have a group one together. Uh, we, we need your prayers for that. We, we praise God for Nick and Michelle. They've come down from the north to join the team, they and their family. They're fully moved in now down to Drew's Town House. And our plan and vision is to plant a church down in that area as well around Drew's Town House. So Ath Boy... Uh, Trim, Kells, Clonmel, and that kind of uh, a district around there. Um, Asboy, I know, uh, doesn't have an evangelical witness uh, in it at all. Trim does, uh, Kells does, but not Asboy. And I was told by uh, a believer in Trim that Asboy has the biggest witch's coven in Ireland. And did you know, our good old Irish celebration in October, Halloween, the Americans, they think it's theirs, but online, if you're watching America, Halloween is ours. First celebrated at the Hill of Wards, a mile outside Athboy Town. Uh, so a very spiritual area, uh, but nothing there with the light of the Word of God. And that's our plan and vision, uh, to see a, a, a group of believers come to meet together there. So please, be praying for us as we move ahead with the work of Dublin Family Outreach, even though it's happening also down at Trustown House. A bit confusing, but we're Irish, so hey, that makes sense. Our portion for today, 1 Peter chapter 3, page 1219. Doing good, doing evil, doing Christ. Many years ago, Julian and myself got a letter, and that's how long ago it was, back in the 90s. Remember how we used to get letters in the, the post? Pre uh, COVID, pre email, pre internet. And uh, the letter told us, we had won a prize. Oh, we're so excited. We won a prize. First prize is a car worth 20,000 uh, pounds, it was at the time. And then there's five prizes. That's the top prize. The smallest prize that you've won is a portable TV, color TV. And I'm not even sure we had a TV at the time. So fabulous. And all you have to do to claim your prize is go to a certain hotel at a certain time and listen to a presentation for 30 minutes on timeshare holidays. Remember timeshare holidays? Remember those? Well, they sucked his in. I thought a TV, I'm from Balamina, a free TV, I thought at least one, a TV, sorry, Cavan, uh, sorry, Willie, <clears throat> of at least one a TV, I'm going. So Jilly and myself arrive at the, the hotel, we're greeted in, everyone's very nice, free food, even better for Balamina man, free food as well, had a really good time, and then we sat down, herself and myself, with this one guy, a salesman, and he has a fabulous sales pitch, and he's trying to convince us to spend £20,000, which was about half of what you would have spent on a house at the time, to buy 
a timeshare holiday. Two weeks anywhere where they had all of these timeshare apartments around the world. And every objection that I put up, that guy had an answer. And I was blown away. And I was under such pressure time and time again to say, yes, I'll buy. Well, when you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and that portion that Claire read to us, Peter, if you're trying to convince people to be Christians or even stay as Christians, this ain't a good sales pitch, Peter. Because in that little portion, there's words there like harm. Who's going to harm you? I'm not sure I want to be a Christian if someone's going to harm me. Uh, if you're to do, but even if you should suffer, hold on a minute, suffer. Nobody mentioned suffering when I became a Christian. I'm thinking about oh, the suffer. I don't like the idea of suffering. Do not fear what they fear. Don't be frightened. Oh, Peter, this Christianity, I think you can keep it. I think I'm not really wanting to be a Christian anymore if I have to go through suffering. Suffering and suffer are mentioned quite a few times in that little portion. It's just a few verses. It's amazing how many times Peter mentions suffer. And yet once you get over the dis, uh, the, the, uh, the very disappointing, very disturbing language, he does talk about doing good. There are some really nice words in there. We're going to look at three. We're going to look at eager. We're going to look at good and right. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? The root word for that word eager, uh, it's also the root from which we got our word zeal or zealous or zealot. Someone who is completely committed to and dedicated to a cause. Someone who's willing to die for whatever the cause is. What is our cause that we are to be zealots for, to be eager to do? Well, it's the cause of good. We are to be eager. We're to be zealots at doing good. Now, you don't have to be a Christian to be eager to do good. There's many good people in the world, aren't there, who aren't Christians. People who, well, have done a good deed for today. That's, that's that ticked off the list. Do you ever think that to yourself? Well, there's my good deed done for the day. Are you eager to do good? It's more than just my good deed for the day. You're willing to die for to do good. You are eager. You're a zealot to do good. But what is to do good? What is the good that Peter is talking about? Well, he further enlightens us by his next word, which is right. To suffer, to do what is right. He qualifies good with right. And the root word for right that Peter uses there, the root word is where we get the word righteous and righteousness. A biblical word that comes up every once in a while. We, we don't really use the word righteousness much in our day-to-day -day language. But righteousness, do what is righteous, that which is in line with God's standards, that conforms to God's standards. Do what is right. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good, to do what is righteous? But even if you should suffer for doing what is righteous... But then you have to wonder, well, what then is God's standard? Now, Peter and the Jews of his day, um, well, they had fallen into a trap, hadn't they? Of thinking that the outward obedience to the law and the regulations, that is how you did what was right. You kept the law, you kept the regulations, and you could almost earn your place into the kingdom of God by outwardly conforming to the rules and the regulations. Do all the right things and you're okay. Slip up and you can have the right sacrifice. All outward. And yet Peter and some of the Jews with him had spent time with Jesus. And their eyes had been opened. In spending time with Jesus, they learned that God's standard wasn't simply an outward conformity it was an inward compassion because God's standard is agape love that's the true standard of God that love that you read about and I don't know I didn't get to watch the wedding yesterday did they read first Corinthians chapter 13 
No. Oh, surprise. Unconventional wedding. Not a surprise. That love that's patient and kind and doesn't keep a record of wrong. God's type of love. Not a selfish love, but a giving love. That is God's standard. The fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace. These are God's standard. These are how we do right by God. An inward conviction that works its way out through to our actions and how we live. Good. You are eager to do good. You're a zealot for good. And yet, Peter talks a lot there about suffering. And the people, the Christians of his day, were suffering. And that suffering was to increase as the decades and centuries went on. And it hasn't changed much today, even though in Ireland we, we don't really suffer very much for being Christians in Ireland, do we? You might get shot down on social media if you say something uh, that doesn't go down well with people about abortion or something, whatever the hot topic of the day is. You could get shot down, you could lose a few friends, you could be unfriended, persecution, terrible. But surely that's nothing compared to the persecution that happens in our world today of Christians. Remember northern Nigeria, Boko Haram, that secondary school was at a couple of hundred Christian young women, high school girls, kidnapped, forced to change religion, forced to marry men that they never met. And whether they escaped or not since then, they need to live with that the rest of their lives, what they went through. They were persecuted. Or in China, I, I, I spoke with a brother from China one time. He told me how he knows of a underground, the, the underground church have a Bible school in a certain province in China. And within one year of graduating from that Bible school, 50% of the graduates are dead. In North Korea, the worst place in the world to be you or me with our faith. The worst place in the world. If you become a believer, you can be killed, imprisoned, or three generations of your family can be killed because you became a Christian. Are you really going to become a Christian? Are you going to suffer for doing good? Are you really? If it means your family are also in danger, Persecution happens today in the world of believers, even though we don't need to suffer here in Ireland. That persecution, that suffering has continued. And yet Peter tells us, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Persecutions, persecution of believers is very real in the world Today, even Peter suffered, crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die the same way as his Lord. Suffering is very real today for believers. And in the background of what Peter was living through, we must recognize it's not easy to be a believer. It's not easy just to accept these words and brush these off as something, well, it was just for then. It is true and real for us today. But you know, they're in China. You see, there's something about this. It's not a good sales pitch for becoming a believer or even staying as a believer, but there's something about it, you know. Because in China, the underground Bible school has a waiting list of people wanting to get in there and study. Even though they know what's coming, you see, there's something about knowing Jesus. There's something about having Jesus in your life that is more precious than life itself. North Korea, there are believers who put their life at risk to escape from North Korea. And they end up in South Korea. The, the biggest church, one million, over a million people is in Seoul, Korea. Very Christian nation, freedom for Christians, no persecution for Christians. You escape from the tyranny of North Korea into South Korea. You risk your life, you get there, you're enjoying freedom. You go to a Bible school and you learn how to communicate the love of Jesus. And then you sneak back into North Korea. Wow. Because there's something about knowing Jesus. There's something about having Jesus in your life that's more precious than life itself. 
And it's good for us to know what that is. It's good for us to be aware what is it that drives these people in persecution and in suffering. Are we today eager to do good? Are we eager to live the agape love life in this world around us? And who knows? Maybe as we do go through a bit of suffering, that's the very thing that God will use in someone else's life to draw that person to him. But we'll come back to that in a minute because we're, we're thinking about doing evil. That was doing good. Doing good, then doing evil. Now, I'm not sure I need to tell you a lot about doing evil. I think we all know enough about doing evil. Didn't we all spend enough time in the little things, the lies, the bitterness, the anger, the rage, the selfishness? Didn't we all spend enough time living as the heathens do, as Paul says in Ephesians. We spent enough time doing those things. We don't need to learn about those things. And actually, Peter, he speaks a lot about doing good and comes back to it again. He speaks a lot about suffering, comes back to it again. And in the middle, there's just this little snippet of doing evil. It's better for you to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Because if we were to suffer for doing evil, you know this, it's at the hands of people. People make other people suffer. And if you suffer for doing good, it's other people who are going to make you suffer. That makes sense, doesn't it? And, and yet it's like Peter's given us a choice. Peter's given us a choice. You can either suffer for doing good, or you can suffer for doing evil. If you suffer for doing good, well, you're going to suffer at the hands of people. You choose to do evil. You choose to be one of those people. You are going to suffer at the hands of him who will judge the living and the dead. He is the one who will pronounce sentence on those who do evil, better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And yet there's a little snippet in there in the middle, isn't there? Is it there at the beginning? If it is God's will, hold on a minute, if it's God's will, what sort of God makes his own people suffer? Is he an evil, capricious maniac, as Stephen Fry once called him? This, this God that we serve, is he that evil, capricious maniac that makes his people suffer? Well, of course not. It's not God who makes you suffer. It might be in his will, but he's not making you suffer. Other people make you suffer, and you suffer at other people's hands. But sometimes we are called to suffer in the will of God. It wouldn't be pleasant to go through. I'm not looking forward to it if it happens to me. I'm sure you're not. Because, well, after all, don't we have enough suffering in our lives? We're struggling. And life is getting harder. I don't want something else in my life that's going to make me want to, it's going to make me suffer even more. But it may well come. And yet, if we suffer, there's a purpose to the suffering. It's where we start to come to doing Christ. Because if, if you look, after he tells us to, in our hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep them a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For, and here's where God tells us, here's where Peter tells us, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? Why did Jesus suffer? He suffered at the will of God. It wasn't God that made him suffer. It was God's will that he should suffer. He suffered at the hands of the Roman guards and the Pharisees and the scribes and etc. Why did he suffer? Why was it God's will for him to suffer? Well, Peter tells you. Just read the rest of the verse. He died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. If he hadn't suffered, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't have the freedom that we have in Christ if he hadn't suffered. That was God's will. You see, there was a purpose for his suffering. And if we are to go through suffering, God will have a purpose. And who knows, as I say, who knows? that your reaction and how you handle the suffering at the hands of someone else. You, you, you react with the agape love uh, by God's standard. You, you react in that way. You, you face the persecution with that attitude. And that could be the very thing 
that God uses, the Father uses in the life of your persecutor to draw that person to Christ for salvation. There's a purpose. If we go through suffering, there is a purpose. But that is where we start, about, start to think about doing Christ. We take him as our example. That's the first way in which uh, we, do, we are doing Christ, what we're taking him as our example. As he suffered, we suffer. If we're called to suffer, then we go through it as he went through it. He went through it in love. We take him as our example. But then we also are doing Christ by always being ready to give an answer to those who ask you the reason for the hope that's within you. You are ever ready prepared. It's like, oh, let's see, it's like having a meal ready. You've invited guests for dinner and uh, you've got all the ingredients and you've prepared the meal and it's ready. And it's ready to serve at exactly the right time. And if they're late, the dinner's going to be burnt. They have to get there. And you're prepared and you're ready. The meal is ready. And you're just waiting on them to come through the door. And there's enough time that they come through. And blah, 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 blah. And we'll be sitting at the right time. It's going to be ready. You're ready. The meal is ready. Are you ready? Are you prepared to give the answer to the person who asks you for the reason? For the hope that is within you. You've researched the meal. You've probably even practiced the meal before. Would you really risk making something brand new that you'd never made before for a special dinner party where important people are going to come and the whole thing just fall, you know, oh, this is a disaster. I shouldn't have tried it. I should have tried something I know how to make. You know the ingredients. You know how to cook them. You know how to put them together. You've prepared. You know who's coming and what they like to eat and what they don't like. No point in making spicy food for me when you invite me for dinner because I don't, I'm not really into spicy food. See, you know the people who are coming. You know the meal you've prepared. You put the research in. You have a knowledge of what you're doing. Are you prepared to give the answer for the hope that's within you? Are you familiar with the hope that's within you? Are you familiar with this thing that is more precious than life itself? For the third way in which we sit, uh, in which we are doing Christ, is that we set him apart as Lord in our lives. Now, I'm from an evangelical background up north, and we always talked about accepting the Lord Jesus, and you make him the Lord of your life, and maybe this is where it comes from. Uh, Christ is the Lord of my life. Uh, But what really do we mean by the Lord of my life? Because we live in a republic. We don't have a Lord the way they had a Lord. We we don't have a queen or an emperor. We're a republic we're not familiar with serving under. And back in the day, back in Peter's day, they had an emperor. And there was only one Lord. Caesar is Lord. That would have been the chant. Heal Caesar. Caesar is Lord. So for you to stand up and say, well, mm, actually... Jesus is Lord. You are standing in complete contradiction of your culture by declaring Jesus is Lord. No, 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 no. Oh, the Romans will say, no, there's only one Lord. That's Caesar. What are you talking about? Who's this Jesus? There's only one Lord. The, 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 the Lord that you have is the person that rules over you. You are under their authority. If Caesar decided this is a new law, that was the new law. He was the Lord. He was the king. He was the emperor. If he decides to do something, that's what you do. You're under his authority. But the good side is you're also under his protection. Remember Paul, how he was able to appeal uh, to Caesar when he was arrested and he was going to be tried? There was no court in the entire empire that was higher than the court of Rome, the court of Caesar. Because Caesar is Lord. What he decides is the law. What he decides, we do it. Now apply all of that thinking to Jesus. Set him apart as Lord in your heart. Now, when we think of matters of the heart nowadays, we think Richard and Mimi and matters of the heart and love and romance and emotion. But back in the day, back when Peter was writing, it wasn't so. Emotions, the seat of the emotions, and I, I can only say this in a northern accent, was your bowels. That's, that's where your, the seat of the emotions was your bowels. Your heart was the seat 
of intelligence. Uh, the heart was the seat of, of um, knowledge, of reason. And then the mind, it was the seat of wisdom and experience. So Peter is saying to us, in your heart, that is, in your intelligence, make a reasoned, intelligent, informed decision to follow Jesus as your Lord. Not Caesar, not the country, not the Taoiseach. We, 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 in, it's always struck me in the, in the pandemic, uh, ministers would continually tell us, oh, trust the science. And I'm, no, I, I trust God. And I, I, I know a believer who wrote to one of the ministers, Minister of Health, and said, well, we're praying for you, we're trusting in God. And the minister wrote back and said, well, actually, we prefer to trust the science. We want to believe the science. And yet, we are called to follow Jesus as Lord. Set him apart, set him apart as Lord in your life. Are you doing Christ? Have you come to know him? Have you put your faith in him? Is he the Lord? Is he the one who calls the shots? Well, you're under his authority. You're his disciple. You're living under his discipline. You're, you're his disciple. I believe most of you here are. And I want to encourage you that in that this morning. Encourage you by thinking and praying uh, along uh, with Dave Ambry and, and Church, of Ch Church in Chains to think of our believers, brothers and sisters around the world that don't have it as easy as we have it, to be praying for them, to get information from the organization and see who we can be praying for to be helping them around the world. I want to encourage you this morning to think on that. Yeah, we're struggling. Yeah, it's hard. How are we going to get through this winter? And all they're telling us about electric bills and gas bills and every other bill and and we, we have to close and feed everybody, and it's not easy, and we're using our savings, and they'll soon be done, and it's hard. I know that. We face that too. And yet, under his authority, under his protection. That is how Peter can say, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Yes, they can persecute us. Yes, they can make us suffer. But we don't have to fear what they need to fear. You see, when Jesus died, the righteous for the unrighteous, he died once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous, that's him. He's the righteous, we're the unrighteous. He did what was right for the unright people. And when he did that, he brought us to God. I want to encourage you this morning. You are made in the image of God. Male and female, he made us. And you belong with God. You were created for fellowship with God. And yet we were estranged because of our unrighteousness. And now one has come who brings us to God. Jesus came to bring us home. That's why he came. To bring you and me home. To be with God. And that is what is more precious than life itself. To grab Buzz Lightyear's famous saying, to infinity and beyond. Because this fellowship with our God is eternal. His love is eternal. Having the love of Jesus in your life is more precious than your physical life. Because it is eternal. Never finishes. It goes on to infinity and beyond. It's worth dying for. At least I think that's what those believers in China and North Korea believe. Or in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan where there isn't even Sharia law. If we were to share Christ and somebody comes to know the Lord, you can be beheaded and they'd be beheaded. And yet we have freedom here. Today, do you know him? Are you going on with him in the face of struggle? And in the face of suffering, are you going on? that others might know this love that is more precious than life itself. Amen. I'll leave with you the word of God. May it speak to us as we live through this week. We're going to stand together again and sing. And you can't sit down for this song. I right, so should have mentioned um, Family Fellowship Church. We started off in a home before we got to uh, the Civic Centre there in Ballyfermot. 
and uh, we have the hall to use there now. But because we started in homes, we just sat on the couches when we were singing. And, and now, now that we're in, the, in like a building, we still don't stand up to sing. And I've, I, I read through the Bible all the time, but I'm still trying to find the place where it says, you have to stand up when you sing. But I know it's our tradition, we're going to stand, and we're, we're going to sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. Let's praise God together. the benediction together. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Now um, we do have tea and coffee through the back, so don't be rushing off. Uh, the festival will still be there. The burgers are not quite ready. I can see them still steaming. So uh, take a bit of time, fellowship together. You're all very welcome. Thank you.